Hello, and welcome to Alternatives Counseling. And today's topic is going to be violence. It should prove to be a very interesting topic. After all, I spent 30 years working in prisons and state hospitals, and the number one thing that will keep you locked up is being violent. And we're going to talk about where it comes from, some of the causes, and then in maybe the second or third video, I will discuss some of the treatments. Today, we're only going to go over the PTSD, anxiety, fight or flight type of violence. And then tomorrow, I'm going to do another one on conduct disorders lack of empathy, narcissistic personality disorder, and psychopathy, and the differences between those two. One of the things that research has shown us about violence and anger is that we used to think you could do primal therapy, scream and scream and get it all out, and that then you would feel better. Well, the opposite is true it's actually going to make you much worse. It's gonna escalate you instead of de-escalate. And so a lot of what I teach my clients is de-escalation, especially in families that have a lot of drama or that are very young and haven't dealt with a lot of issues yet. We tend to overreact. So anger and violence research shows that do not let your anger get out of control. The more it does, the more propensity towards verbal or physical violence. And the definition of violence is physical. It has to be physical with a weapon or some type of, of um, rod or something, or it has to be physical with the hand, with the feet, with, with um, wrapping, with pushing, that kind of thing. But a lot of times violence is unintended and so we're going to talk about brain trauma and violence today and how when people have traumatic brain injuries especially if the frontal um, temporal lobes are involved where their emotions are they tend to have a lot of fight or flight which means cortisol and adrenaline in their blood and as we know, cortisol and adrenaline, it's like revving the engine at seven or eight grand. Um, you can only do that for a little while and you're gonna have extensive damage. And again, that's what happens with brain traumatic. When they're always in fight or flight, in the blood all the time, according to Rayo in 2009, they have this cortisol, adrenaline, and then they have a propensity towards more of the neurological diseases. The same with PTSD. The difference between brain trauma and PTSD and somebody who is domestic violent is brain trauma and PTSD don't want to hurt anybody. They have empathy. They feel for their victims. They often live alone. A lot of the stories about Vietnam vets that you've heard, you know, because they come back so combat ridden and we'll call it fight or flight all the time the only way they can calm down is when there are no people around no sounds around so they isolate in the forest up here in Oregon or in you know caves or, or things like that so that they can eliminate the triggers but they feel for their victims okay and the same thing with um, PTSD they have empathy for their victims and they want to learn how so brain trauma PTSD Hormones to calm self are blocked or destroyed. And again, your dopamine, your serotonin, your ability to take a deep breath, think about it before you act is gone if you don't have those hormones. And when we talk about violence, we have to also include some of the research on mercury poisoning. Um, from about 1960 on, Dentists have used silver amalgam, which is half silver, half mercury. And the dental industry has claimed that because it's sealed, the vapors don't get out. 
but a lot of the research shows that's not true. And especially in ones that are older, like more than five years old, they start to let out vapors. More than 10 years old, definitely letting out vapors. And some people still have them at 20 and 25 years later, the same mercury amalgams. We have found mercury poisoning to be directly associated with violence. And it's not the amount of mercury that's in the brain, but again, it's what passes the blood-brain barrier. And some of the research is in such big words, I don't want to get into that right now, but essentially, yes, there is a correlation to Alzheimer's, there is a correlation to um, cognitive deficiencies from mercury amalgams. And if you would like to look at the research, please go to my website at www.alternativescounselingllc.com and I list all my research. You just have to click on the tab and you can look it up yourself and decide for yourself what you want to think, okay? The last one that I'm going to go over a little bit about violence is PTSD, okay? And again, the difference between PTSD and, say, somebody with conduct disorder or somebody who's narcissistic personality disorder is the empathy that they feel for their victims. At some point in time, they go, wow, that was wrong, okay? That was a bad thing to do to someone. When you're working with conduct disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, and domestic violence, that's not true. There's no empathy. They were right, and the victim was wrong, and they're going to prove it no matter what. Then you've got domestic violence, okay, if it's in the home. If it's outside the home, it's, it's domestic violence, but it's usually done with sex or with something, drugs or alcohol, to lure people the person in okay where somebody's already living in the home those things are um how do you say they're not as useful so the narcissism lacks empathy um the other one that i wanted to go over a little bit is alcohol and a lot of the research in alcohol and domestic violence says that if a person is drinking and again the amount is not so important as to their reaction to it, the more violent they get. The more it gives them an excuse or a, um, yeah, an excuse that, you know, that's why I did I was drunk. I can't help that. Okay? Um, and then there are some people that just maintain, you know, a nice .08 alcohol level 24-7. They never really get drunk, but they continue to sip on a beer or a wine or, you know, a, a little marijuana now and then and they when they when they do that enough they don't have enough happy hormones they get depressed they get angry and they resort into what they've learned from their families so before you get married <laughs> go visit the family and stay with them for a while and you'll see what you're marrying as far as character goes um we're going to talk more about empathy and how to assess for it and how to treat it and a lot of the research is in oxytocin for it is destroyed in our gastrointestinal tract and it has to be administered um, breathed in they say the injections but from the research that I'm reading the injections don't give you the immediate uh, results that the breathing in does, especially with the autistic children and looking at that research. They don't inject the children. They just spray the oxytocin on a blanket that the child sleeps with, so they're breathing it in constantly. But this oxytocin is the hormone of bonding. It is what we as mammals have when we give birth, and so that if the baby's deformed or sick, we won't give up on it. We're bonded. We're in love. That's that hormone. And that hormone isn't passed on or isn't initiated in the baby if there is a serious C-section. Okay? So I showed the research in my website. But what happened is in 1985 till now, the rate of C-sections has quadrupled. 
And so a lot of babies are being born C-section that it wasn't really a medical emergency. And what's happening is if they don't go through the birth canal, they don't get that little crown that they get when they're born going through that little tight squeeze. <laughs> and when we get that, we initiate our hormones. It pushes into our brain and all those hormones begin. We breathe, we suck, we bond, we know hunger, we know light and dark. Okay, we start to sense our environment a lot better. That seems to be missing when these children are born and their Epgar scar, where it shows they're sucking and stuff, is very weak. It helps to initiate nursing so that the baby has this really strong suction. If you've ever nursed a healthy baby, you know what I'm talking about, the vacuum cleaner <laughs> effect. Um, and if you've had a weak baby, you know you have usually to expel the milk um, with mechanicals so that you can put it in a bottle and, and give it to the child, okay? That is kind of the difference of oxytocin. Now, oxytocin is also involved in comfort levels, okay? So if I walk into a room and, and think about when you're pregnant and how happy you are and how your hormones are all up, okay? That's kind of the oxytocin effect. And you really don't have a big fear of the world. But then after you stop nursing and you get that postpartum depression, that, that month or two or three where you have no more hormones generating and you're going back to your normal levels. And if you're not a very healthy or hormonally healthy individual, then they're not gonna be there. And that's what drives a lot of women into the post-pregnancy depressions and suicides and hurting the kids and things like that. And we can treat that very easily with oxytocin, okay? The other thing that it, cortisol reduces oxy. So if this person is constantly in fight or flight, they're not gonna have oxytocin. So the child that comes into my classroom that was smacked around that morning because he didn't do something on time or he forgot to do his homework or something or he made a mess at the breakfast table. You know, it's always a little thing with people that are temperamental. Um, he's going to be afraid. He's going to be in fight or flight because that hormone stays in you an hour and a half at least. And so he comes to school and he sees me pound on the desk or he sees me get excited. He's immediately back in fight or flight. I have a little story that happened to a little, a little man of mine. He ran out of the classroom and the teacher referred him because he didn't understand why he ran out and he wouldn't come back to school. And so his mom brought him into the session and we talked and I asked him what happened and then I asked him, well, what about the teacher remind you of your dad? Because I know this was a domestic violence case. The mom had escaped. She had taken the three children with her and she was doing great in this new area, but this one child was having a lot of issues, okay? And she was wondering what she could do to help. And so this was the trigger. The teacher had a baseball cap, and he wore this baseball cap, and that's exactly what his dad wore. So when the teacher got mad or the teacher's heart rate went up, this little boy went into fight or flight. And without this oxytocin, because remember cortisol and, and and adrenaline destroys it, then he had no way to calm himself back down and he wasn't going back. He was in fight or flight and scared, okay? And it's a protective mechanism. It's to keep us out of dangerous situations. So it was doing what it should do. Um, next week, I'm going to continue on with domestic violence, with narcissistic personality disorder, and with some psychopathy. And these are people that lack the empathy. And how do we assess for this? And then how do we treat these people? Or are they treatable? Okay? So thank you for joining me. Please hit the like button. I need some inspiration. It's been tough doing these videos. And I only have 80 viewers. But share them because I think there are people out there who would benefit from this and at least understanding where it comes from and if it's treatable. Okay, thank you and have a great week.